let's go ahead and transfer our design onto the cast. Now the first thing I'm, I like to do is place my direct retainers. So I'm going to have a ring clasp on this particular tooth and it starts out with a guide plate and a mesial rest. The first thing that you should prepare is your guide plate because you want to lower that survey line, you want the guide plate to be just from the marginal ridge approximately two to three millimeters apical to the marginal ridge and you want your survey line to come out um, at that position. I am trying to lower my survey line from this position down a couple of millimeters. So I have to prepare a parallel guiding plate. I can do that. I can't do that in the mouth with my surveyor, obviously. So I'm going to be using this cleodiscoid to see if I can lower my survey line down to that two millimeter mark down there, two to three millimeters. And I have achieved that. Now the reason I prepared the guide plane first is that now I'm going to prepare my rest and if I had to take it into the depth of my fossa, I would have to kind of start over on my rest. So I'm going to now remove, you would remove around a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of the marginal ridge. And this is a ring clasp, so it's going to go around to the in this direction to the buckle, so I'm preparing a little sluice way here. My direct re or my reciprocal component will be on that side, so I'm also going to have a distal rest. So I'm going to prepare my rest back here. I'm going to have a little bit of a sluice way because my arm is going to come in from this direction and it's going to exit the opposite side of the tooth. So I have a little sluice way both ways. I want my central fossa to be a little bit deeper. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and draw my rest. I'm going to have a mesial rest in here on it in red, then I'll remember that I have to prepare this. There's my little sluice weight going out the distal, and I'm going to have a distal rest. Normally the marginal ridge is prepared approximately a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, and this point in here has to be deeper. The idea is to take enough tooth away so that you can reproduce the anatomy with the uh, metal that is on top of it. Alright, I have a guide plate coming up the surface of the tooth right here to this rest. And I'm going to outline my rest. And I have th this rest will become a guide, a, a reciprocal component as it comes in this direction. The reciprocal component is kept in the middle of the tooth. This is the buccal cusp of a mandibular and that buccal cusp is my occluding cusp. So I don't want any interference with occlusion. Outline that rest. Then my direct retainer arm is going to come all above survey line in the first two-thirds of it and it's going to come down, engage my .01 undercut that I have already marked down here, and it's going to come back up. It would follow around behind, and it would be at or above the survey line as it goes back in this direction, and it's the bottom line of my reciprocal component comes back up here and it goes down as a guide plate on that mesial surface. So once again comes up, goes around that rest, becomes the top border of my reciprocal component coming back in this direction. That circles the rest, becomes the top border of my direct retainer, direct retainer two-thirds above the survey line one-third below, it comes back up, 
that becomes the bottom that must stay above the survey line or else I've got to alter that tooth back there. Comes this way, goes up, and becomes a guide plate. So there's the direct retainer, which is called a ring clasp. The ring does not go 100% around the tooth. It is not connected here to the guide plate. It is open or it cannot flex. Now I can clean that up a little bit later. I cleaned this clasp up a little bit to give you a better look at it. If you took this arm below your survey line, which is often the case, then you must do a little bit of adjustment and resurvey to make sure that your line is now apical to your direct retainer arm. So make any modifications additionally on that tooth that need to be made. All right, we're going to move up to the canine, and on the canine we did a distal incisal angle rest. I've got a little bit of a chip on my canine here, but the distal incisal angle rest is over here at the angle of the tooth, and it comes in approximately a millimeter to a millimeter and a half toward the mesial. It has to be deeper at this point than it is at the marginal ridge. So I'm going to probably would be using something like a um, tapered diamond to do this. And it would be, you have to have a minimum of millimeter, ha millimeter to a millimeter and a half of metal on that corner. So I don't know if you can see this, but I'll zoom in a little bit see what is happening on this tooth. You don't want to get it undercut also because the metal has to go into position so you don't want to undercut it. But take a little bit of a corner off here then you round this little corner off so that it's not undercut. And this point has to be deeper than this point. It needs to be a positive seat remember. Okay and it usually has, is rounded off on this corner and round it off over here as you can kind of see that that has taken place. Okay. So we also have a little bit of a guiding plate problem so I'm going to adjust my guide plate which I should have done before I did my rest because hopefully I won't destroy that now. That rest but you can see that I'm taking off some of that rest, so that's the point that we're trying to make of doing the um, guide plate before you do the rest. I have to take a little bit more off my rest in order to make room for it. Let me just check my survey line to make sure that I have a guide plate here now. Oh, I've got about a couple millimeters there. so. My rest will come up and over the incisal edge. I want it to come up and be like a coat hanger. It can hang on the top of that thing. All right? So my rest will come down like this. That rest, this edge of it, will become my guiding plate. This part that comes over the top will become my lingual plate of my major connector. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to go ahead, I'm closing that embrasure, covering the cingulum, go up to the contact point, cover the cingulum, up to the contact point, cover the cingulum, up to the contact point, and right up like this. Now I might choose to put an additional rest over here because my major connector is going to be quite long and if I wish to I could put another rest in the mesial fossa. We'll see what we get as we go. I also 
am going to go ahead and draw my base attachment back here because my eye or my wrought wire will come off of that base attachment and I don't exactly know where it is. On the lingual, I come down at the distal lingual line angle and I'm going to come around and parallel my ridge, but I gotta leave enough room to set a tooth, premolars and molar, in base attachment. And this comes up and it joins that guide plate right there. On the buckle surface, I'm going to have um, some acrylic resin coming down here like this on this patient. And it'll come up around that frenum attachment and come right back up here. And it's going to create a finish line on my major connector over in this area. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my finish line right in that area. Okay. The outside border of my base attachment comes off of this guide plate here. And I'm going to come forward and back up to this guide plate right here. And then I need to put some holes in it to retain the denture teeth that I'm going to put in here. <coughs> My wrought wire now, I'm going to go ahead and draw it now, is usually soldered back in this location and it comes forward, comes forward, comes up the back of this guide plate. It's coming from being soldered back there. It comes up this guide plate right in this area. And then it comes down. It has to stay above the survey line. And I want to keep it as low as I can because it's more aesthetic if it's down there. And comes below the survey line and comes up. I put my O2 undercut marks on there. And there's my rock wire. It's drawn as a single line. It's not outlined as we did with our other direct retainers. And I'm going to put WW out here so that I know that I've got a rock wire on there. Over on this other side, I'm going to prepare my mesial rest for the eye bar. Eye bar has only a mesial rest, so we want to stay in the confines of our tooth and we have to have a sluice way coming up here for that metal to get over that marginal ridge there or over that little ridge and not be in occlusion with the tooth opposing it so we have to have a sluice way here we're not taking an arm through there so we don't need a sluice way coming out the other side for the eye bar and we need to make this point deeper than our marginal ridge so that it is a positive rest seat. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw my rest. And my direct retainer then. Let's see, my rest will come like this. Fill up this fossa. And it's going to come over here and become plating on that premolar. Where it comes across here, it becomes plating on my premolar. On this edge, it comes down, and we're going to avoid the marginal gingiva by a minimum of three millimeters, and I'm going to have a guide plate right here. The plate comes up about this position, and it's going to come back and at least catch the narrower part of that tooth before it comes down and we avoid the marginal gingiva. Now our major connector is going to come back like this. It's going to slant backwards a little bit. It usually goes down to the floor of the mouth, the functional floor of the mouth, so you have to measure this on the patient. Comes around like this and it goes backward and swings up 
to attach to that guide plate right over there. On the opposite side, we're going to finish off this base attachment by first bringing our acrylic resin, and again the acrylic resin comes right up to the base of the uh, major connector, comes back, it should come to retromylohyoid fossa, come on up and over covering retromolar pad, it comes down and comes around like this and goes right up to our abutment tooth. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and draw the base attachment. Base attachment starts at this point, swings up, comes back, and it usually goes back two-thirds of the distance to the beginning of retromolar pad. We don't want to have base attachment going up that slope because it will get in the way of setting teeth. So our base attachment comes like that. It comes over a bit, crests the ridge, and comes on around like this and joins our guiding plate right here. Now in that base attachment we're going to have some loops that will secure the teeth on and this last one will incorporate a processing or a tissue stop for processing the denture. And one last thing we have is that we have to have an internal finish line where the plastic joins our major connector. Now I haven't placed my eye bar yet and the reason is I was waiting for these metal struts so that it would cast easier but my my eye bar will come off this area right here and it's a little wider at its origin comes down straight down and it comes and parallels the ridge and makes a rounded right angle at approximately six millimeters below the marginal gingiva and then at this point where the eye bar comes out of the acrylic it's usually two and a half uh, millimeters in width and it slat tope, uh, tapers down to about two millimeters I'm going to take this back and join it to my origin so that's what my eye bar would look like the eye bar contacts the tooth at the 0.01 undercut and then we carry it on up to our survey line and either way we want about a two millimeter by two or three millimeter in height pod that actually um, holds on to the tooth and stabilizes it but it can't be into any greater than an 01 undercut which is this little red mark that I have right here so let's see if I have everything um, my indirect retainer is this rest right here. If I have my fulcrum line, I drop a perpendicular to my fulcrum line, that would determine the position of my, of my indirect retainer, the position farthest away from the fulcrum line. But on the mandible, we do not put an a, a occlusal or a, an incisal rest on lateral and central incisors on the mandible. So I think that I have everything and um, for every clasp assembly, I have a rest, direct retainer, reciprocal component, guide plate. Same over here. I don't, I, I do have a, a situation here where I need to have a um, two millimeter guide plate here and where it's all above survey line and my survey line is a little bit high on this tooth. So I would prepare that guide plate, check and make sure that I have in fact lowered my survey line. And I have, I have lowered my survey line. My guiding plate, guide plate must be in the apical one millimeter of above my survey line. So I have my survey line down here, my guide plate is in the apical 
one millimeter, which almost takes it up to the um, marginal ridge on that tooth. I don't have any problem. I've done all my modifications. And this should be my final design. I'm avoiding the marginal gingiva by a minimum of three or four millimeters here. And the height of my major connect of my major connector in here has to be a minimum of five millimeters. So if I don't have eight millimeters to the floor of my mouth, then I would have to plate. Uh, even though in our text says and it suggests you try to pick some other type of a, a clasping system than the eye bar which calls for that dipping. If you must plate on any of these clasp assemblies you should be plating at the survey line. That way when the um, forces are placed on that distal extension it will actually it disengage the tooth as that goes down. Last thing that I want to do is remark the areas that I made adjustments on my cast. So I will mark in red the guide plate that I adjusted down a couple of millimeters, make a circle. I took the survey line from the top part of that circle and moved it down two millimeters. The other area that I adjusted was this guide plate right here. Make a circle. I moved it from right at the marginal ridge down to this position and mark some cross hatches through there. And this particular marginal ridge. I actually adjusted over to this corner, so I'm going to make my circle a little bit larger. Circle it in red, move my, mar my survey line from here down to here, and put some cross hatches in it. Those were the only areas that I actually adjusted on this particular cast. It was a pretty good cast in pretty good shape. So those three areas, and I'll make a note to myself, guide plate, guide plate, and guide plate. The rest are pretty much self-explanatory because they're all prepared in red. Let's do a quick summary of the contraindications for the use of this eye bar over here. If at the six millimeter mark below the marginal gingiva, if this eye bar had to stand out away from the tissue more than a millimeter and a half, then the eye bar would be contraindicated. If the tooth leans buckly and that forces that arm to stand out away from the marginal gingiva, that also would be a contraindication. If the tooth is extremely bulbous, that would be a contraindication. If there's a real high frenum attachment in this area that would interfere with the lower border of the eye bar, then that would be a contraindication. And obviously, if there's no 0.01 undercut on the mid-facial surface of the tooth, that would be a contraindication. One other thing that we have to think about is if we followed that design where we took our major connector back to the posterior area of this tooth, one thing to consider is if that tooth leaned so far to the lingual that this major connector had to stand out very far from the tissues and the tongue would get caught and irritated back there, then it is definitely the indication for the ring clasp versus plating with the major connector extended posteriorly.